This is a dream. This is Riel's dream. Tonight, the Manitoba Métis Federation ratifies a modern-day treaty. NWAC will be able to provide more educational supports while enhancing empowerment supports for at-risk populations and survivors of human trafficking. Plus, more funding to help implement the MMIWG inquiry's calls to action on the fourth anniversary of the final report. Some of them had only a few hours to pack. They were told to bring pets, important documentation, medication, and that's it. And severe wildfires continue to burn across Canada. Good evening, Tansi Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. The final report of the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls was released four years ago. On the weekend, the federal government provided an update on its progress meeting the report's 231 calls to justice. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. On Monday morning in Ottawa, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller said he understands the frustration out there that the government is not moving fast enough on the calls to justice. He said they have made some important strides in recent months on putting in place accountability measures. What we heard last year from advocates precisely was you know, to answer that accountability portion because um, without accountability it's very hard to trust the federal government, particularly in an area where the, the trust is very thin in the first place. It's why um, we had this federal, provincial, and territorial roundtable in January, and at the end of which I appointed Jennifer Moore Ratchet to, to move on that accountability portion, which is putting in place an ombudsperson. There's still no definitive timeline for when an ombudsperson will be in place, but Miller said he expects a report from Moore Ratchet in the next few months. I'm looking for a more comprehensive report to from her in in the late fall. Um, I didn't want to put conditions or a timeline on her myself. This is, I think, a timeline that she herself put forward to me. And then we'll look at that and, 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 and look at the process that we need to do to, to really um, firm up the ombudsperson role. Meanwhile, across the river in Gatineau Monday morning, the Trudeau government announced $1.2 million in funding to help the Native Women's Association of Canada with its programming. This funding means more training, the development of customized strategic plans and capacity building for member organizations in all provinces, in all territories to address violence. NWAC will be able to provide more educational supports while enhancing empowerment supports for at-risk populations and survivors of human trafficking. NWAC CEO Lynn Gru said the new money will help the organization continue its grassroots work. The capacity building funding from Wage Canada being announced today helps us to sustain the work, the heart of the work of NWAC, which is our communities. We will now have more staff and more liaisons to help our PTMAs, our member associations, with training in areas of proposal writing, finance, communications, and generally to help keep our community safer. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. From Prince George, British Columbia to St. John's, Newfoundland, a newlywed BC couple that live along the Highway of Tears are walking across Canada to raise awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous people. Charity and Cameron West made a stop in Winnipeg over the weekend with their dog Gretchen. Just in time for the anniversary of the MMIWG final report's 231 calls for justice. The couple stopped at the Manitoba Legislature where a rally in support of the missing and murdered was held. Charity West says after many losses, the couple decided to start the journey in early May. She says their walk is opening the conversation to non-Indigenous people. We're the ones that are, you know, this is our day-to-day -day life and we notice in our day-to-day -day life that we have, we do have a lot of allies, like there are a lot of non-native supporters, it's just they don't know how to engage and that's kind of our goal is just to make sure that everybody's engaging and talking and like they're, to, just to approach all these conversations with some open, openness. And it's really humbling to be in other territories and just have so much, so much supporters that are there. Well, we want to hear what you think about the four-year anniversary of the final report into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and any other thoughts. Here's how to continue the conversation. 
You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or you can leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Be sure to follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Well, it is shaping up to be a devastating fire season already and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and several ministers were on hand today to discuss the situation. APTN's Leanne Sanders has more. This is a scary time for a lot of people. Prime Minister Trudeau says federal models show this fire season will be especially severe across Canada. According to Emergency Preparedness Minister now, Bill Blair, there have been over 2,200 wildfires nationally to date, well ahead of the 10-year average of 1,624 fires. Blair also said more than a dozen of the 413 wildfires burning are directly affecting First Nations communities. There are also 18 active wildfires specifically impacting First Nations, with six in Alberta, five in Saskatchewan, one in the Northwest Territories, four in Quebec, and two in Nova Scotia. And as of yesterday, an estimated 26,000 people remain evacuated from their homes across the country. The Prime Minister says he heard firsthand from people displaced by wildfires in northern Alberta on a recent visit to Edmonton. Some of them had only a few hours to pack. They were told to bring pets, important documentation, medication, and that's it. The Prime Minister also spoke about the role climate change is playing in wildfire activity. And while admitting it is getting worse, he didn't commit to funding any new national programs to fight fires. Um, with the given projections, it is expected that we have enough resources to cover the summer. If things get worse, uh, we, have, uh, we are developing contingency plans and we will, of course, make sure that we are there, whether it's leaning more on international supports, whether it's uh, standing up uh, other resources, uh, we will be there to ensure that all Canadians are protected right through this summer. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Island Lake RCMP in Manitoba announced an investigation today into the death of a two-year-old boy in Red Sucker Lake First Nation. They say they were called about the boy's death on Saturday, June 3rd. In a release, they say that a young child was taken to the local nursing station in medical distress where he died despite medical assistance. Island Lake RCMP, Major Crime Services and the RCMP Forensic Identification Unit are investigating. Red Sucker Lake First Nation is roughly 700 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg, close to the Ontario border. An estimated 4,000 Red River Métis gave unanimous approval to a modern-day treaty with the Government of Canada in Winnipeg on the weekend. Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand was visibly emotional in a speech ahead of the vote at the extraordinary General Assembly. Thousands of people in person and virtually raised their red foam hands in approval of the Red River Métis Self-Government Recognition and Implementation Treaty. Negotiations first started in 2016. The treaty will now go through Canada's ratification process and be introduced to the House of Commons this fall to solidify its place in legislation and the Constitution of Canada. This is a dream. This is Riel's dream. This is something he wanted and something they stole from him. They took it from him and they robbed it from him and they robbed it from us. They took away our future and we've waited a long damn time. And we're not going to let no government get away, including Justin Trudeau, from this issue. He better pass this thing in Parliament or he better not knock on our door. I'll tell you that. All right, we have to pause for a moment here, but we still have plenty more news to come, including rising homelessness reveals racial tension in one Quebec city. I'm just a person that I struggle. I'm still struggling, but I try to make it positive. Welcome back to APTN National News. A city in northwestern Quebec is facing a rising homeless population, one that's mostly indigenous. The Native Friendship Centre of Val d'Or wants to help find solutions, but says some attitudes towards indigenous people 
need to change. Amelia Fournier has more. Victor Tusky is trying to get his life together. With the help of intervention workers at the Valdor Friendship Center, he's been sober for about a month. I'm just a person that I struggle. I'm still struggling, but I try to make it positive. He was a police officer before his alcoholism took hold of his life. And I had an apartment, I had everything. This is like that, I lost it. I went through a tough time, so, so that's, that's why. I, um, I ended up in the streets there. An Algonquin man from Rapid Lake, Tusky has lived on and off the streets of Valdor for the past five years. He says he's experienced racism throughout his life there. Fifteen years ago, Tusky says he was attacked unprovoked by a group of 30 or so white men. From head to toe, every one of them kicked me. And uh, I'm, I was kind of surprised I was uh, still alive. I was in bed for 10 days after that. While Tusky says that today, violence against Indigenous people has diminished, he says many non-Indigenous Valdorians still have negative attitudes towards Indigenous people. They put everybody in the same boat, you know. And that's why I think their, their mentality, you know. That's, uh, they have to change their mentality towards uh, individuals out there. Tensions between Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks in Valdor have existed for a while. And racial tensions are rising along with the homeless Indigenous population. As residents express their frustrations in a May 15th city council meeting. C'est des Amérindiens qui sont là en groupe. Puis ils sont là régulièrement. Puis ils sortent de là comme des zombies à 5-6 heures le matin. Mais où ce qu'ils vont? Ils s'en viennent en ville. Faut que la ville elle agisse à un moment donné. Even the region's provincial representative had something to say at the heated city council meeting. Quand on dit des mesures sérieuses, c'est de la répression. Ça veut dire c'est de trouver moyen d'enfermer. Et comme on l'a dit, le fameux noyau de 25-30 individus qui font la crainte. Joanne Lacasse manages the Native Friendship Center's services for homeless people. Often the solution for uh, the population, also the, the business people uh, from the downtown area, their solution is not in my my backyard. So the reflex is to chase away the persons that are in homeless situations, but but they're not going away. She says homeless people have a lot of access to resources in Valdor, but we feel that there is a contribution that needs to be made not only by our key partners but also by the population. The social tensions are real and uh, and in certain cases our homeless people feel that tension. They are victims of racism. Edith Cloutier, the Friendship Center's director, says that most Indigenous people in Val d'Or are not homeless, and many of those who are have lived in the city for generations. Quand on entend les gens avec des propos de dire, ben, on devrait retourner les personnes itinérantes dans leur communauté, ben, leur chez eux, c'est la ville. C'est pas la communauté. Cloutier has been working for decades to improve relations between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community, particularly after a 2015 Radio-Canada investigation brought to light abuse allegations from Indigenous women against Valdor police officers. Ça a été un travail très délicat, très sensible, mais on a réussi au fil des années à euh, trouver, euh, à, à renouveler, si on veut, euh, ces, ce, ce dialogue-là, cet espace pour marcher ensemble vers la guérison et la réconciliation. Valdor gets its police from the Sûreté du Québec, or SQ, the provincial police force. In order to make the community feel safer with the rising rates of homelessness, Valdor's mayor requested more SQ officers at the May 15th council meeting. And Lacasse says the Native Friendship Center supports the mayor's request. Ça va faire partie de la solution, évidemment, pour atténuer un petit peu les, euh, les, les craintes de la population. Lacasse says the other parts of the solution include building housing for people experiencing homelessness, something the Native Friendship Center is planning to do in the next year, and ensuring people like Victor can get the help they need to heal. It makes me feel good about myself to be able to have hopes and dreams, you know? So that's one thing that's uh, is making me feel good about myself to be responsible that uh, day by day. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Valdor, Quebec.
All right, it's time to step aside briefly one final time. When we come back, a famed Millbrook First Nation artist opens up his own studio. Alan's artwork is, is, uh, is phenomenal and uh, it also incorporates a lot of the hieroglyphics that, uh, from, from ancestors before. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Today's photo of the day comes from Dorothy Hunt. While staying at the Black Rock Resort in Eucalypt, BC, Dorothy captured this shot of the fog rolling in. Thank you for sharing that one. Dorothy is beautiful and a little eerie at the same time. If you want to be featured as our photo of the day, be sure to email your shots to share at aptn.ca or you can tag aptn news on Instagram. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 8 degrees in St. John's and 13 in Halifax, 3 in Cartwright and 8 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, 17 in Quebec City and 20 in Montreal, 23 in Clear in Toronto and 20 in North Bay, Clear Skies and 20 in Wawa and 21 in Timmins. 15 in Churchill and 29 in Norway House. 29 in some showers in Barron's River and 31 in showers in Winnipeg. Mix of sun and cloud and 32 in Regina and 21 in North Battleford. Rain and 20 in Buffalo Narrows and rain and 20 in Stony Rapids. As we head west to 21 in Fort Chippewan and 23 in Peace River. 23 in Clear in Edmonton and 22 in Calgary. Sunny skies in 24 in Vancouver and 25 in Bella Coola. 21 degrees in Prince George and 19 in Fort Nelson. 22 in Beaver Creek and 22 in Old Crow. 15 in Norman Wells and 18 in Fort Liard. 21 in Fort McPherson and 12 in Colville Lake. 12 degrees in Cambridge Bay and clearance 7 in Chesterfield. 1 degree in Arctic Bay and 8 degrees in Iqaluit. A world famous Mi'kmaq artist, Alan Sillyboy, opened his own art studio in his community, the Millbrook First Nation. Angel Moore reports. About 100 people came to the opening of Mi'kmaq artist Alan Sillyboy's new studio. It's fantastic. It's really a good, uh, a good turnout, and uh, it's just a good energy. It's really, it's what I was hoping for. Angela Doyle Faulkner owns Sillaboy's art and is purchasing more. His work is absolutely amazing. He's an amazing all new artist, and to be here in Millbrook, celebrating with him and seeing all this amazing art everywhere and the beautiful turnout from all the, the friends and people who just came out to support him is very heartwarming. Sillyboy incorporates Mi'kmaq petroglyphs, ancient stone carvings into his art and other traditional Mi'kmaq designs. Chief Bob Glode of the Millbrook First Nation says, Alan's artwork is, is, uh, is phenomenal and uh, it also incorporates a lot of the hieroglyphics that, uh, from, from ancestors before. Silly Boy's paintings are on display throughout the Maritimes, including the Halifax Central Library, as well as galleries nationally and internationally. Robert Bernard, Executive Director of the Nova Scotia Indigenous Tourism Enterprise Network, a nonprofit organization, says Silly Boy has impacted cultural tourism. You know, I think he's been a huge proponent in educating mainstream society with not only his art the past 30, 40 years, but in his music and his appearances. And the opening was a community event, a fundraising barbecue for youth sports team provided lunch, and local musicians in support of Silly Boy performed in the space next door. Yeah, I'm feeling really good. I'm really, it's good energy here, and it's good to see people I haven't seen for a long time. It's, it's really great. And then, you know, later on, all the musicians, we get together and we're going to have fun. 
Silly Boys Gallery is part of the economic development of the Millbrook First Nation, located 91 kilometers northeast of Halifax. Globe says. Provide opportunities for our uh, residents, our community members, to be able to uh, showcase their work, showcase their art and their skills and their talents here in the community to give them a, a, a place to do business. The day was a celebration of a beloved artist. Doyle Faulkner says. This is very important for the Mi'kmaq in, in Mi'kmaq simply because um, this is not only encouraging other all new artists, but our youth. And when our youth come here and are inspired by Alan's art, that is what really makes this so more, much more exciting. Silly Boy is a multimedia artist, such as music, books, and video, making art his entire life. Well, yeah, when I wake up, I know I'm going to make something. I'm not sure what it is sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's just, just making, making art every day. And uh, to me, that's, that's a very full life. The Allen Silliboy Art Studio is open weekdays. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Millbrook, First Nation. Cree designer Helen Oro showcased her designs at a Fiji fashion event over the weekend. Oro is from the Pelican Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan, and she traveled to the South Pacific Nation to highlight her designs. Fiji Fashion Week is a world-class event, and it is one of the most prestigious Indigenous fashion events in the world. It has been Oro's goal to go for years, and she traveled with her own models and photographers. Oro says her designs are inspired by traditional regalia, but with her own spin to it. A lot of my inspiration for a lot of these pieces really does come from our traditional like regalia that we wear at powwows and such. I, I just get so much inspiration from the different accessories that each dancer uses, not just like female, but male as well. Bones of Crows, a film told through the perspective of a Cree residential school survivor, hit theaters on Friday to rave reviews. The film is written, produced, and directed by Mary Clements and stars Grace Dove as Aline Spears, the film's central character. Yolanda Skelton is the movie's costume designer. She says she kept wardrobe details consistent throughout the movie and staying true to how people dressed throughout consecutive decades was a challenge. I think it was like 14 decades, like from 1890 all the way to 2009. And so the fashion changed all the way through there and as well as the fashions uh, for the different nations. So if we were using regalia, we had to make sure that we had the right time periods and we worked with um, specialists and different people with um, private collections and things like that. Be sure to check your local theaters for showtimes of Bones and Bones of Crows, excuse me. All right, that's all we have for you tonight. If you missed anything from the show tonight, you can visit abtnnews.ca to catch up on those stories. For all of us here, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech, Kinnanaskwinton, and have a great night.